next step is. I've entitled my message, Righteous by Faith and Earth's Final Hour. You know, the world is on its way out. It's uh, in the midst of some pretty strong birth pangs. Uh, they're political for sure. I had somebody tell me the other day that if the former president goes to jail, there'll be a civil war. I don't know. Could be. I don't know if he'll go to prison or not. Uh, all you can try to do is figure out what's truth based on what you hear. Uh, you look at the mental health crisis that's going on, the physical health crisis. You go back over the last two years and you find out that COVID wasn't really good for much of anything. It wasn't good for education. It wasn't good for marriages. It wasn't good for the economy. It wasn't good for a lot of people's faith. Some people ran in reverse, uh, which is fear. I'm still waiting to find out what it was good for. Now, it was good for learning how to limit our free speech rights. Um, in the name of some better good, we were willing to undo some good. And even now, I still get messaging from organizations and people that makes it very evident that there's still some things that can't be talked about. I find that exceptionally troubling to a free society in name, having what Ellen White would call the Constitution, the grand old document. I mean, she really thought a lot of our Constitution. But it does appear that we've surrendered some of what we considered made up life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the name of security. And this morning, I want to remind you that security, while necessary in some measure, is what you sacrifice for progress, and without some risk, there is no advancement. And I want you to know that the less secure you are in God, the less able you are to take risk for Him. So what I'm talking about is life or death for you and for the church, for me. I want you to know how certain your future is. I want you to know that the first piece of armor you're supposed to put on is the helmet of salvation so that you know if, even though you're wearing the armor, you get a mortal wound, even though you're clothed with the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and your feet are shod and you've got the sword in your hand and the belt of truth is on, if you should still receive a mortal wound like some of our reformers did and you fall to the earth, you go down knowing that my life is hid in Christ. Now, if your lens is wrong, and in the name of what you want, you've tried to take in more that can really be encompassed by a true, narrow-way Christian experience, then you could have a problem. You could have hit the button that says, oh, that Seventh-day Adventism is too restrictive. I can't get everything in the picture, so I'm going to hit the button, and I'm going to, I'm going to take in more than the old-fashioned Adventism could take in. You may just be a little contorted in the sight of heaven. You may be a misshapen Christian. And I'm here to tell you today, there's two things I want to, um, I want to take a, if, if the gospel armor was an ax instead of a sword, I'd like to take a few chops out of a few trees. The first tree I want to take a chop out of is worldly Christianity in the name of a broader-minded Adventism. And the second thing I want to take a chop out of is worldly Christianity in the name of conservative Adventism. Now, I want to take a chop out of both of those trees. I'd really like to fell the tree because there's only one real article, and it's the article that produces the fruits of the Spirit, and it is, it is a cultivated experience in a relationship with God. I want to talk for a minute about conservative Adventism. I want to talk about an ingrown Christian experience. Now, some of you have had an ingrown toenail or an ingrown hair, and you know that both of those things are exceptionally uncomfortable. I want you to understand, your body talks to you when things aren't growing the right way. And I want to say to you this morning that an ingrown Christian experience, which is not about Christ, but it's really about you, is as uncomfortable for you as it is for the people you're trying to witness to. As a matter of fact, you always feel just a little bit unnatural about it. Now, when it comes to properly growing inside the bounds of spiritual health and vitality, there's some pretty uncomfortable moments too. But the difference between one discomfort and the other is that God will sometimes take you on a journey of discomfort to grow you, whereas when you take over on the journey, your discomfort doesn't grow you, it just discomforts you. And 
I'm here this morning, by God's grace, praying for myself first and for those that will listen, that you'll come away from this message fully surrendered, unafraid, and moving forward with Jesus. So take your Bibles and open them up to a little bitty book that's hard to find in the Old Testament called Habakkuk. Habakkuk, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. So when you get to one of those books, you'll know you're getting close. And I want to encourage you, keep trying to memorize these things. They try to slip out of, uh, they try to slip out of your mind. Spirit of Prophecy will tell us that these minor prophets are written more for our day than for the future, actually the past. So these were written more for us than they were written for the ones who received them so many years ago. In the book of Habakkuk, we have a storyline exceptionally similar to the one we're in today. Now listen to me. We know that trouble is coming. As a matter of fact, we can even quote out of the book of Daniel chapter 12, and we can tell the world and ourselves, and you can hear in this message, it's a time of trouble such as what? Never has been. So that means, since we're good students of history, it's going to be bad, like really bad. And the problem with knowing that is that if in the midst of knowing how bad it's going to be and how good it's been, we might want to take the good with us as long as we can until we get to the very verge of bad and then sh shutter it, shuttle it, get rid of it and grab onto what's coming. The problem is, is that the key commodity you need headed into what's so bad, it's never been this bad, is something you only get following the Christ of the narrow way, namely confidence in God, faith. Now, in Habakkuk's time, it was going to get bad, really bad, probably worse than it had ever been. As a matter of fact, God told Habakkuk that the Babylonians are coming, the Chaldeans, and it's going to be terrible. As a matter of fact, all the future promises of messianic glory seem to be laid in the dust by God himself. It's so bad that without a divine intervention by God, you could give up hope. Chapter 2 of Habakkuk, verse 1. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. He's hoping God will change his mind and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered and said to me, record the vision and inscribe it on tables that the one who reads may run. In other words, I want this word to get out. It's not run away. It's, it's the old-fashioned form of social media, which was somebody running to your town with a message from the prophet. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it certainly will come, and it will not delay. This sounds an awful lot like the great disappointment of 1844. It sounds an awful lot like waiting in 2022 for a promise and a church faith and a movement that was birthed some 160 years ago. God promised to return, if we want to go back to millennia ago, the promise is true, God will carry through, it is going to happen. The problem is if you're Habakkuk, or the problem is if us, you look to the future and say, huh, I'm not sure if I'm up to that, huh, I'm not sure if I want to go through that, huh, I'm not sure if I have enough faith. Verse 4, behold, as for the proud one, other versions say, if he shall draw back, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous one lives by his faith. Now, I just want to tell you that there's a little problem with this verse. And the problem is, is that the verse can be read three different ways, even just with a basic Hebrew reading, because the word for faith and faithfulness is the same thing. We don't know if the uh, manuscripts that the uh, authors wrote had little pronoun marks in them or not. And we come up to a place where we have a variety of interesting things that happen with this verse. 
not the least of which is three uses of it in the New Testament. Now, why does it matter? Well, I'm going to tell you why it matters. The verse can read like this. It can read, the just shall live by faith. The verse can read, the just shall live by his faith, which means her too. Or the verse can read, the just shall live by my faith, which has got a slightly different nuance to it, doesn't it? Here's the good news. We're going to go on a journey, and we're going to look and see, and by the time we get to the end, we're going to find out that the Bible is quite solid in its messaging, and the beauty of this subject matter is such that once we understand how it could or should read, we're all going to go away, I think, with a greater assurance that it's reading the right way. And which one is that, Pastor? Well, I'm not going to talk to you about that just yet, but let's see how Paul uses it. Take your Bibles and turn over, if you would, to the book of Romans chapter 1. Now, this is the greatest treatise on righteousness by faith in the New Testament. I didn't say in the Bible because I think there are amazing stories in the Bible that show people living by faith. And they're not living to earn their faith. They're just trusting that God who gave them salvation is going to get them all the way home. And by the way, this is the one thing I want you to have an assurance of, is that the God who gave you your salvation can get you all the way home too, even if we go through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know where the road's taking us, but I do know this. You wouldn't want to come up to that valley and not have some faith. So this morning, I want you to understand how righteousness by faith fits into the last hours of verse history because they are coming. They are soon. Even the secular world recognizes that the weebles that wobble but don't fall down are not a good metaphor for planet Earth because it's wobbling. It's like a, uh, a little gyro that you've pulled the string on, and it's in its final movements where it's all over the place. It's not standing up anymore. In the book of Romans chapter 1, we read in verse 14, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. Here we go. Amazing verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now listen, I was sitting on an airplane yesterday. Um, I left out of Houston early yesterday morning, and I've, I've got to get, I hate to say this, it'll be an admi admission that I was running rather late. Unfortunately, it's a little habitual with me, and I've got to get my sermon title to Tony. So I don't know what I did. I'm sitting in row 38, seat A, so I'm in the back. I mean, like the very back. But somehow, after I type my sermon title in, my phone comes on and announces to the whole plane what my sermon title is. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm pushing buttons to get it quiet. Why? Am I ashamed? God must have wanted to know that tomorrow there'd be a sermon called Righteousness by Faith in Earth's Final Hour. I don't know who's thinking about it now that wasn't thinking about it then. I do know that I had to think about why am I quieting this phone? Am I embarrassed? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The problem is sometimes our own internal family dynamics can make us feel a little ashamed about some things, and sometimes we can feel ashamed out in public. Of course, we don't want to be bad witnesses. We want to be good ones. But I'm not ashamed of the God, Jesus who followed the narrow way and in faith went to a cross so that I could know beyond the shadow of a doubt God's done the hardest thing that's ever been done in the entire universe and in all time and all eternity so he could redeem me. I'm not ashamed of that kind of love and that kind of God who reached down and turned me around and put me on the path of life. For it is the righteousness of God that's revealed from faith to faith. What does that mean? From faith to faith, as is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. You need to know, in most of the New Testament, Paul doesn't say by his faith, and Paul doesn't say by my faith. Paul always just says by faith. But when you take that phrase from faith to faith, maybe it's worth contemplating just a little bit. It might even hold the key for how we could interpret Habakkuk 2.4. Is it my faith that's going to get me through? Or is it his faith that's going to get me through? Or is it his faithfulness that's going to get me through? Let's keep going. First, first evidence of Paul. Now, you need to know 
that Paul, when you read in the New Testament, will often quote scriptures from the Old Testament, and you'll do a cross-reference check, and you'll look them up, and you'll say, well, that doesn't sound exactly the same. You know why? It's not. That's because Paul was reading out of a book called the Septuagint. When you see that LXX, that means 70. There were 70 Hebrew scholars in Egypt that translated the Old Testament into Greek, and this is what it appears Paul is primarily using. And so when you read the Septuagint, and it says, the just shall live by my faith, that's God speaking. That's a slightly different message than the just shall live by his faith, little h, that's your faith. And there's some kind of chasm that needs to be bridged here because what the Bible says does matter. And if Paul in the very first uh, lap around the, the race of faith will say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the just will live by faith, this is the beginning of several chapters of amazing hope and encouragement that it comes to you as a gift. And in a relationship, you are to respond. And once you're in that relationship, God wants you in his power to obey. But let's go to another chapter, Galatians. You'll take your Bibles and turn to Galatians. We'll find here that we have another of the three times, Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, where Paul takes Habakkuk chapter 2. Now, I want to remind you that there are 23,145 verses in the Old Testament. And I've pointed out to you before that twice in the book of Matthew, Jesus will use the quote from Hosea, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In other words, I want you to know my heart of compassion before you think you're somehow needing to lay yourself on the altar of surrender and the altar of giving. It's not about what you do. And as a Christian, the first thing I want you to witness about is that I'm a God of understanding and compassion. But here we have three times in the New Testament, much smaller than the old, where Paul will quote from Habakkuk chapter 2. Here we are, Galatians. We'll start with verse, chapter 3, verse 8. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Now, in the book of Hebrews, Paul will make it very clear the gospel was operative long before there was a baby Jesus. Here in the book of Galatians, we can see that God is justifying the Gentiles by faith. The gospel is preached beforehand to Abraham. Those that will suggest to you that somehow the Old Testament is law and the New Testament of grace have not read the New Testament very carefully because the gospel is in the Old Testament from the Garden of Eden to the last verse in the book of Malachi. And what we have going on here is a reminder that from confidence in the heart of, Ab of, of Adam and Eve to the confidence in the heart of Abraham, God's faithfulness to the covenant far exceeds man's ability to keep it on his side, but God will keep it even in the man form so he can bring both things together. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus walks the walk of humanity and Jesus is God and he brings it all together so he can bring us all back together. It's good news. So the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And you know what? Abraham believed, verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. You know, the work of sanctification is the work of a lifetime, but most of us haven't come to the end yet, and we know we're still making some mistakes. The good news is, by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, he's going to continue a transformative work that brings everything back together. It's not your work, it's your cooperation with the power and the presence of the living God. Verse 11, now that no one has justified the law before God is evident, how is he going to prove it? He's going to quote from Habakkuk 2. The righteous man shall live by faith. All right? Doesn't say by his faith, doesn't say by my faith. And it certainly doesn't say by my faithfulness. Now let's go to the one I like the best, the book of Hebrews. Now Hebrews was written by Paul. Some contend with it. The spirit of prophecy is clear. And it's very evident to me that it is a fact, even though those that want to uh, contend with that can. The message is still glorious. Hebrews chapter 10. Now we know that chapter 11 is the faith chapter. We're going to see the third place where Paul quotes from Habakkuk. We'll start with verse 35. Therefore, 
Do not throw away your confidence. Doesn't this sound a lot like Habakkuk? Wait, though the vision tarry. In other words, don't give up. It's not turning out how you thought. There's been some dips, some valleys, some detours. I drove 6,000 miles this summer. There are moments when the road didn't look like I thought it was supposed to look. As a matter of fact, I was on a little road back into a campsite in Yosemite. And I thought to myself, after going several miles on what was descending into a poor excuse for a logging road, am I on the right road and can I turn around if I need to go backwards? Fortunately, my phone still had a little bit of signal and I saw I was close. Don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. You know, those are the long run races, not the sprints. So that when you have done the will of God, Obedience matters, but it doesn't earn your favor. You may receive what was promised, for yet, in a little while, he who is coming will come, and he will not delay. What do you say, church? The vision, though it tarries, wait for it. Here we go, verse 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now, there's a couple things I like about this text. You could read the text and say it's messianic, and there's no doubt that it is, but it's not in this case because the Messiah has come and gone back to heaven. It's really a beautiful thing that God would refer to his Jewish church, which this letter is written to all of us, and he would write to those who would read it, which it's written to you, and he would say, my righteous one shall live by faith. This is a beautiful expression, I believe, of the application of, Hebrew, of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, on the church of God post the exposition and the exhibition of God's love and faithfulness in sealing the covenant on Calvary. He calls us saints in other places, which any honest person would have to quote the reference of Jesus when Jesus says, using the parable of the servants, after you've done everything you've said, call yourself an unprofitable servant. But here we have, in the midst of this challenge, an amazing reassurance of how God, when we are hid in Christ, looks at us. But my righteous one shall live by faith. Well, is that his faith? My faith? Your faithfulness? Or just faith? Well, let's keep going. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. It's a warning. I want you to understand that all of God's assurances have warnings attached to them. When God told him in the garden, eat of every tree, but don't eat of this one. When God assured Joshua on the banks of the Jordan, nobody's going to be able to stand against you, he said, but don't turn to the left or the right. When God comes to a people and makes a miraculous promise, he puts in line the guardrails to keep you on the road. Some people are so determined that they'll break through the guardrails because they know so much better, and they're not willing to have anybody tell them what to do until finally they run out of energy Sometimes, usually in the middle or latter part of their life, and they give up, and their new message is, man, I wasted a lot, didn't I? If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure. And well, take good courage, friends. There's some pretty famous people that shrunk back a time or two. Abraham, Elijah, David. There are folks on the list that uh, they're just as human as you and me. We've uh, kind of put them up on pedestals, and at some level they should be. At another level, they're people just like you and me. Good news. But do you want to shrink back? Do you want to come this far? I mean, let's face it. Some of you were born and raised Adventists. You've given up nothing. Am I being too hard on you? <laughs> I mean, it's your culture. You grew up in a ghetto. I mean, uh, Bering Springs. And it could be Loma Linda or Chattanooga. It could be Orlando. You've never had to shrink back because you've never had to give up anything to come to church with your family. You've gone to church school. Some of you, though, 
Your parents wouldn't even talk to you after you said, I'm going to become a Seventh-day Adventist. I want to tell you, I, I had a nice visit with one of our older members last Sunday in their home. I'm telling you, the lady told me her grandma wouldn't even talk to her. She got a Voice of Prophecy Bible lesson from an aunt. She was pretty much ostracized by everybody in her family. I want to tell you, she's a strong older woman, even though she's kind of frail today, but her faith is strong in Jesus. Don't lose your confidence. But maybe you've never had to face the situations where, where, oh, let me turn that phone off real fast. Everybody didn't need to know that it's righteous by faith in the earth's final hour. If, if this is all you've ever known, maybe you've never been tested, so don't be too glib. For those of you that have lost spouses and family and jobs and friendship circles, you're part of the group that needs to continually remind us these are the things to expect sooner or later. Why does this verse mean so much to me? Verse 39. But I love Paul. <laughs> He tells us that we're the righteous ones and we live by faith. God has no pleasure in those who shrink back. But then he, I know the chapters were inserted after he wrote it, but I like where the break is. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to preserve the preserving of the soul. Now, I want to go one more place here. Maybe just one. Go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. I want to take you to the great shrinking back moment. The book of Numbers, Old Testament, fourth book of the Bible. I, I want to do something with you here that helps you understand whether it's my faith, his faith, faith. I, I want to make sure when you walk out of the doors here today, you understand something beyond the shadow of a doubt. Here we are in Numbers chapter 13. I want to remind you that 12 spies went out. It wasn't God's plan. It was their idea, and God allowed it. I want to remind you that 10 came back and said, well, 12 came back and said, it really is everything we've heard about. I want to remind you that 10 of them said, but there is a little problem which isn't so little. Let's read about it, verse 25. When they returned from spying out the land, this is Numbers 13, verse 25, at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them, to all the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land. What a show and tell. I mean, hey, give me your staff. This, this, this uh, cluster of grapes so big, we're going to have to hang it on your staff. Put one end on my shoulder, one end on yours. How long they carried that, I don't know. Thus they told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this, look at this, this is the fruit. I think it's so apropos they brought back grapes from which the sign of the covenant of Jesus' blood the grapes, we're still drinking the blood of the grape unfermented in our communion services. However, there's a problem. The data says that the people who live in the land, and we are the data gatherers, they're strong. Make sure you understand, really strong. And the cities are fortified, big, very large. And moreover, we saw there the descendants of Anak, the giant, and Amalek, which, by the way, has a bunch of bad blood history with us Israelites, is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, far more advanced societies than us, well entrenched, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. But that's enough of that speech. We're going to get an interruption. Then Caleb quieted the people. Why? <laughs> If you're a leader, you need to understand the disproportionate role of your words and your actions and your influence. Ten men turned two million people 
into a naturally, they needed no help for this because it was a default of theirs, a grumbling mass. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and he said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, that won't work. We're not able to go up against the people. They're too strong. Now, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Caleb and Joshua can't be quieted. They're not trying to shut their phone off. (laughs) No, the message is going forward. We can do it. We can do it. And so we're going to get a little cancer culture chapter going on here. They pick up stones. We're going to stone them. God intervenes. Those ten spies die, but the evil spirit in the hearts of the people isn't dead, and they say it would have been better, and it would be better if we were to die in this wilderness. And God says, I think this might be the only way to make it work. Now, I want to do something with you. Moses doesn't want to go down to Egypt. God says, what do you have in your hand? Throw it down. It's a snake. Woohoo. If you were in Sabbath school, I showed you that rattlesnake. When I got close and it got into that S shape, it's like, oh, you're too close. Grab it by the tail. Worst place in the world to grab a snake. Everybody knows that. It's a rod. He does that. He smites the water. You've got boils. You've got flies. You've got frogs. You've got hail. You've got lightning. You've got darkness. And you've got death. And finally, of course, most of those things never happened to the Israelites. They were in Goshen. And finally, Pharaoh says, get out. They take the gold and the silver and the diamonds. They take the jewelry. They go out with all the unpaid wages of many tens of years of slavery. They weren't slaves all the time they were in Egypt. That part was probably only about a hundred some years. But they go out rich. They get to the Red Sea. What are we going to do? The Egyptians come to get them. The cloud comes down and separates. It turns into a fire by night. In the dark of night, the Red Sea splits open. They go on dry land, walls of water left and right. They come to the waters that are bitter. Moses knows they're bitter. God turns them sweet. They come up to the mountain. There's no water. Moses strikes the mountain, and water comes out of it. Food's falling every day. Finally, they leave there. They've been a year and a half. It's now time to go into the promised land. Every day except Sabbath, they're gathering food, and every day they're drinking out of a river big enough to feed a city, to provide for a city of two million people. This is no little stream in the desert. And they come up to the first time in their life where God says, all right, take a risk. Everybody wanted out of Egypt, especially while the plagues were falling over there, but not here. They take that unleavened bread, they gather up their donkeys and their sheep, they put their carts up to the oxen, they make their way out, but the very first time they get to the place where they have to make a decision, they have to take a risk, they've got to do something, they say, huh, don't think so. Now, I'm here to tell you as a denomination The devil would like nothing more than to make sure we hit the repeat button. God can do for me, and God can do for you, and I'll thank him for everything he does. Might be good if we praised him for who he was, not just what he does. And the devil is actually hoping that he can actually unprepare us by putting us in a lifestyle in which no faith is necessary. We've got good degrees and good educations and a pretty decent society. It's in trouble, but it's still better than most others. He wants to put us in the place where the data 
and the experts and all the securities of life are ours so that when that moment comes when we're hanging by the rope or the rope is dropped down, you know, that's how the vision of the narrow way ends. The road gets skinnier. This vision of Ellen White, this painting by Alfred Lee, it's on the General Conference Ellen White Estate. What a sad and inspiring painting all at the same time. I love to look at that mural. I can stand there for a long time and see these amazing institutions and these famous people. And then if you look carefully as the road gets nearer, you see people falling into the abyss. You see, Seventh-day Adventists are to be the most loving and courageous people on the face of the planet because they're going from faith to faith. In other words, God says, take a step. You get to decide if the answer is yes or no. He may say, I want you to make a commitment you haven't made before. I want you to give more money than you've given before. I want you to do something or stop doing something. But I want to tell you how it works. If you hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, and you say, well, thank you, no thank you. Had an interesting visit the other day with somebody. Let's come back to that ingrown Adventism. Let's talk about veganism. That's always a good topic, isn't it? The person was an organic vegan. Now, it's always easier for me to make sense of this stuff when I know the people. It turned out I knew this person. They're an organic vegan, raised a Seventh-day Adventist, kids, but they don't go to church. How do you know when you're a religious vegan, not a religious person who is vegan? I'll tell you how you know. Minus any allergies or allergic reactions, you might be a religious vegan when you would never deviate, even for the sake of a fragile situation where maybe a little bit of something that came from an animal might not be your undoing. No, I don't want to be down on vegans. Let's go to the um, preppers. If you have your Bibles, go back to Habakkuk. He addresses this. Habakkuk chapter 2. Yeah, I want to get you used to those little prophets. Habakkuk chapter 2. Other places address this in the Bible as well. Habakkuk 2 verse 9. Let's talk about ingrown prepperism. Food, water, electricity. Hey, I like all those things too. You know what the problem is? <laughs> You can be a self-centered Seventh-day Adventist and nobody except the people. Well, no, eventually everybody's going to figure it out. But nobody really knows it because the undertow of self is undoing the true experience of Seventh-day Adventist Christianity. In other words, you might be an organic vegan that will never deviate because you're afraid of dying prematurely. Hey, veganism's good for you. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 9, Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You want to be off the grid? Not a problem, necessarily, unless you're getting off the grid mainly just to look out for yourself. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that selfishness has a way of bending the lens to where I see my will as God's will. And God wants to make sure that doesn't happen. So he has this very inconvenient little thing called fellow church members and spouses and friends who believe, who intersect with your life and challenge some of your ideas. And when you get mad when they challenge your some ideas, your wrong spirit is probably a, a kissing cousin or an identical twin to a wrong way of thinking and living. I want you to think about this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, there's a group of people at the very end who come up to him and say, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. And he says, you got confused. 
Hijacking spiritual power to do spiritual things is not the same as becoming more and more like me. Yeah, woe unto the person who sets his nest on high so that he can be delivered from the hand of calamity. You know what Habakkuk has to say? Though the fig tree doesn't blossom and there be no cow in the stall. He doesn't imagine he's getting a get out of jail free card because he's a true prophet, although the Lord assures him, I believe, like he assured Ebed Melech, the one who delivered Jeremiah from the pit. God knows his own. When Jerusalem fell, both in A.D. 70, not a single Christian died because they listened and they got out of the city before the Romans came back. When Ebed Melech and Jeremiah were in Jerusalem, Ebed Melech was not in jail, Jeremiah was. Both of their lives were spared. Even though those angry Babylonians had had enough of these lying, inconsistent, hypocritical Jews who told the king of Babylon over and over again, we'll do what you say. And as soon as they were gone, they went into rebellion mode. There's nothing more dangerous or damning to the Christian experience than living a life where you're never challenged to examine if you're true to the spirit of truth. The Bible says the fool isolates himself and rages against all sound wisdom. Beat him back with your anger. Stay away from them. I had a conversation 10 days ago at the end of my minister's meetings at Camp Asabo, an individual who did not see the last few years of life the same way I saw it. I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that these last two years have shown us unequivocally that freedom of speech is an endangered species, that cancel culture is running amok in the institutional powers of both business and government, and that I should have some say in an experiment over what goes in my body. These things are unequivocal to a commonsensical approach to life. If it wasn't an experimental use of a drug, it might be somewhat different, but probably not much. This person had been in a group of meetings, and a discussion had come up with fellow ministers. It wasn't long until my church and my name came up. He had started the conversation. He's actually a friend of mine, and I believe a true Christian. In the midst of the conversation, when it turns to me and this church, he was willing to say or to think, I'm not sure if he's the one that said it, but he thought it for sure, and I think he might have said it, why don't we wait till Ron's here to have the rest of this conversation? It's a novel idea. Sounds like one the Bible would countenance. We've never really had that conversation. Many months have gone by. COVID is not gone. It's just the trauma and the messaging is different. And so finally, as I'm getting ready to go on my little silver Prius, we say goodbye to each other. He says, we need to talk sometime. And yep, we do. Well, preachers have a problem. Their family members have to wait around on them a lot of time because they get to talking. And that happened right there. Eagle Lodge over here, cafeteria over here, standing in the middle of the drive lane of the parking lot. We start this conversation. In the midst of this conversation, this man whom I've told you I believe is a genuine Christian admits to me that he is controversy averse. He's conflict averse. That means he doesn't like conflict. I don't know anybody who does like conflict. But I do know if you're going to be a leader, you're going to have a little, or else you're not the leader. I don't know how you can be a living, breathing individual and not have some. I especially don't know how you could be married and not have some. <laughs> By the way, for all of those that had some recently, my wife and I had a nice two-hour one on our vacation. Take courage, friends. Maintenance to a marriage is worth it. I won't tell you what it was over. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing terribly important. But isn't it funny how we can get ourselves tweaked? So we're standing there talking in the, in the parking lot, and he admits to me that he's conflict averse. Oh. 
I'm not surprised. Some of you by temperament are way more averse than others, and some are less averse. We're not supposed to go around making arguments happen, but the Bible does say as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another man's countenance. He made a powerful statement to me as he was, he's growing. He said, you know, we're not very practiced at following the Bible way. You may not be practiced at your home. Marriage is the best place to learn because nobody loves you like your spouse. Kids is one of the hardest places to learn because they'll send the zingers without as much care. And I had to say to him, friend, brother, you know, when you're in an argument with someone and inside of you there's all this ugliness towards that person, nobody else knows it but you. But if you're dishonest and you don't admit it, you've got a problem. And if there's one thing, you know, you hear the story, one story that sticks in my mind is from Light Unshackled that debuted in this church, the story of the martyr. He was running across the ice. His pursuer fell in. He stopped and went back and delivered his pursuer, who promptly had him arrested and killed. If that's how it works, then you should be at least able to disagree with a fellow Christian about something in society without feelings of angst, resentment, negativity, or bitterness. When you're no longer in a discussion of an idea and you've got these roots bearing fruits in the conversation, at least in your head, stop and be honest with yourself. God will have written in his book every time the Holy Spirit prompted us to do something or not do something. The judgment is not going to be easy on the Christian who's not hid in Christ and who is not the real deal of surrendered and laid all on the altar because you won't have to go very many chapters before they can say, okay, we've seen enough. Close the book. The undertow of selfishness is rotting out. It's eroding away the bank of some people's Christianity and it's going to cave in on them at the wrong moment. When Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, my righteous one shall live by faith, but God takes no pleasure in those that shrink back. Here's how it works. Let's bring it in for a landing. Here we go, just like the wheels on that 737 yesterday at O'Hare Airport. I want you to hear them screech. Your faith grows by doing what God tells you to do. That looks risky. I know. I'm going one step. Oh, I didn't lose a friend. Oh, I didn't lose a job. Oh, I didn't lose a promotion. Or maybe, oh, I did, and it's okay. I have peace. God doesn't put you on a perpetual stretch motion, all right? He's not the great divine torturer trying to weed selfishness out of you. He's replacing what was naturally in your heart with the unnatural fabric of his love. Another step. Until just like Bob Hess said, one of our associate head elders today, who's probably in his 70s, by the time you get to be my age, you can look back and see how faithful God has been. So here's the deal. The Septuagint says, the just shall live by my faith. God's talking. Some versions say the just shall live by his faith. And some versions say the just shall live by faith. The word for faith in the Hebrew is the same for faithfulness. You know what the truth of the matter is? Your faith would not exist without the intervention of God whose character is completely, categorically, undeniably, incontrovertibly, unchangeably faithful. Your faith only came from him. You got a measure of faith from God. That measure grows as you do what he says. And we're not to walk up to the future going, oh boy, it's going to be terrible. Better get off the grid. Hey, I don't mind. Get off the grid. I'd love to be off the grid myself. But I do have some other obligations like my local donations to this church and some other things that matter to me that are going there before they start taking care of me. How is the lens in your life are you a good religious vegan Adventist? 
who won't go out of your way for anybody, who really just veiled lives for yourself? You wouldn't touch one of those unorganic lentils because, you know, those fell off the vine after they sprayed them. <laughs> I was too poor to eat like that, live like that. I'm still too poor to live like that. I'm not poor. I don't mind something organic if it's on clearance. And I'm not against you folks that want to serve me organic food when I come to your house. But I'm against the idea that the only way to be healthy is to figure out the elite way and take advantage of my elite education and my elite inspiration of understanding about nutrition and live that way. And who cares if millions are starving somewhere else? Are you hearing me, church? I'm living by God's faithfulness. And you know what? Along the way, I've gotten some faith. He gave me some in the beginning. It's bigger than it was last year. It's bigger than it was three days ago. Because God gave me something that I could worry about. I mean heavy. And then I thought I was going to get relieved. And the person said, no, you've got to wait another day. All right. Oh, I don't want to go. There's giants in the land. But fortunately... He's taken me over some ground. Some of it very similar to what I had to face while I was out of the country. And I tell you, being out of the country is the worst place. Being by yourself and getting a load laid on you, it's the worst place. I'm praising God. He was faithful again. And you know what? That's all he's ever going to be. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a time of trouble coming, just like for Habakkuk. But the just will kick it into gear now and let the Lord do a little bit of faith growing. And this Adventist church is going to come alive and we're going to win some victories. And we're not going to go face the jaws of the giant or the lion without knowing that the lion of the tribe of Judah is in our midst and in our heart. Righteousness by faith. I'm considered by God's grace righteous. I stumble, I fall. But I'm living under the goodness of his grace who in spite of me and all my spiritual ancestors have found God to be faithful even when I wasn't. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. And in the meantime, I cannot turn my life subtly selfish and look out only for myself. You want to homeschool your kids? Just make sure you're not homeschooling them to keep them away from everybody else or some other thing. You want to eat as a vegan? You want to be off the grid? All these other things. Just make sure you have permission. There's a voice. There's principles. There's precepts. Now, I could have ended this sermon on a wonderful song called Great is Thy Faithfulness. But I've chosen not to do that. I'm ending it instead on a song called trust and obey because I want it in your head when you walk out of here I'm not planning to live afraid and act afraid I can't nothing is more emotionally central to disavowing my avowed allegiance to God than acting like he's not in control especially I want you to notice that verse where it talks about favor and joy after you lay everything on the altar. Listen, friends, the village church is called to lead a charge to get back into the game and lighten the world with the glory of our Lord and Savior. You're in a hard time right now? Hang on. The vision is for your well-being. It's for your salvation. Don't give up. Be bold. Pray. That's what I do. I return to my knees I get peace, and I keep on going. Let's stand together and sing it. Lord, may the prayer be heart, our heart be what he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, but trust and obey. Lord, this message began with an entreaty not to live a self-serving, self-focusing human experience, and I don't want anyone to go out of here overly examining their motives, but if people haven't been looking at their motives, may they take time to talk with you and make sure things are right. As we are here before you at the end of this service, Lord, I want to pray that 
If there's someone here who needs to give their heart to you who's heard your spirit speaking to them, if there's someone here who needs to turn around or acknowledge a higher level of experience, help them in the final moments of this service to say in the quietness of their own heart, Lord Jesus, you can be Lord of everything. I'm asking, Lord, that that would be true in my life for the rest of this day if I get to live it. I'm praying that morning by morning, I, with my brothers and sisters, would wake up and pour out our lives as a drink offering to you, saying, Lord, it's all yours. And I want to thank you for Jesus, who walked that narrow way all the way to the cross, denying self, even the fellowship of the Father, which we won't fully understand in all of eternity because we don't fully understand three in one. But I'm praying now, Lord, may we be just like Jesus. So if we hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. If we're not sure, may we find a trusted counselor who will tell us the truth. May we keep praying. And may our faith grow. May we be your righteous ones who don't turn back, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.